Welcome to another episode in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today, we're going to take continue our discussions of how Viper uh, increases security when you're doing programming on the Ethereum platform. Uh, this, this, this slide deck and these, these videos are available under Creative Commons license. Um, some of the content in the slide deck came from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas and Gavin, and I'd like to thank them for making their content available under the Creative Commons license. Um, so here's what we're going to take a look at. We'll talk about decorators, function and variable ordering, uh, infinite loops. We'll talk about compilation, protection against overflow errors at the compiler level. We'll also talk about reading and writing data in Viper. So let's start by talking a little bit about infinite loops. Um, so first of all, in theory, people claim that you can't have an infinite loop in Ethereum because there's a gas limit. Um, and so, you know, if you write code that would normally cause an infinite loop, eventually you'll run out of gas and the infinite loop will fail uh, because you got this upper bound. However, um, you could still write an infinite loop and it would just exhaust all the gas, which could be a problem um, from a security perspective to lose all your gas because then your application will fail. And so for that reason, we still wanna protect against infinite loops, even though there is a gas limit. Um, and so what did Viper do to minimize the possibility that your programming smart, your program smart contract will actually have an infinite loop in it? Well, first, uh, the while statement. The while statement is in Solidity, but Viper got rid of it. You know, um, you know the while loop, remember, is a while and you have a Boolean condition. And so long as the Boolean condition is true, you keep on executing. So if that Boolean condition was always true, you have an infinite loop. So while just doesn't even exist in, in Viper. Uh, secondly, um, there is the for loop, which is another type of loop. Uh, for typically has a Boolean condition and then it counts, it's got a certain number of iterations. Um, and in Solidity, that number of iterations could be deterministic or non-deterministic. That is, you could have a variable and you could pass in and you could essentially have your for statement being the equivalent of a while loop in Solidity. Uh, in Viper, however, no, you can't do that. In Viper, um, the upper lim limit on the number of iterations has to be determined um, and you can't put in an uh, integer literal into the you can't put in a variable into the range, you have to have an integer in there. So for example, you might define your for statement has 10 iterations and you then know you're gonna go through that for, for loop 10 times. You can't just say, well, so long as I is less than a, a variable number, you'll keep on going through the for loop because um, that would not be deterministic. Uh, recursive calling can be written in Solidity, but not in Viper. Uh, so again, this is another place where um, Viper attempted to avoid the possibility of an infinite loop by eliminating recursion. So there's a number of places where Viper, again, is trying to limit what developers can do to make the language uh, easier to audit, easier to confirm there are no bugs, and easier to avoid losing someone's hard-earned ETH. So let's talk about preconditions and postconditions. Viper handles preconditions, postconditions, and state changes explicitly. Um, you know, this does produce some redundant code, but it allows for the maximum readability and safety. So when writing a, a smart contract in Viper, developers should keep in mind the following. From a condition perspective, what is the current state and condition of the various Ethereum state variables? From an effects perspective, what effects will this smart contract code have on the condition of the state variables upon execution? That is what's gonna be affected and what will not be affected. And are these effects what the, the writer of the smart contract actually intended? And finally, from an interaction perspective, um, after you've exhaustively dealt with conditions and effects, it's time to run the code. Uh, but before deployment, you wanna logically step through the code and consider all of the possible permanent outcomes, consequences, and scenarios that would occur from executing the code, including interactions with other smart contracts. Ideally, each of these uh, 
points should be carefully considered and then thoroughly documented in the code. Doing so is going to improve the design of the code and make the code easier to read and more auditable. Let's talk about decorators. So the following decorators can be used at the start of each function in Viper. You can use the private direct the at private director decorator. The at private decorator makes a function inaccessible from outside the contract, pretty similar to the private access modifier in Solidity. The at public decorator makes a function both visible and executable publicly, again, similar to the public uh, access modifier in Solidity. Uh, so for example, if you're using the Ethereum wallet, you can view those uh, functions uh, while viewing the contract. Um, the at constant decorator um, is a, so a function that has that decorator is not allowed to make changes to state variables. Um, and the compiler is going to reject the program with an error if the function tries to change a state variable uh, if the constant decorator is applied to the function. Uh, finally, there's the at payable uh, decorator and only functions with the at payable decorator are allowed to transfer value similar to, um, you know, payable and constant and so on in Solidity. Viper, however, implements the logic of decorators explicitly. Each, for example, the Viper compilation process will fail if a function has both a payable decorator and a constant decorator. This makes sense because a function that transfers value has by definition changed the state, so it cannot be constant. Each Viper function has to be decorated for either public or private, but obviously you can't have both. Let's talk about function and variable ordering. Uh, each individual Viper smart contract consists of a single Viper file. Uh, in other words, all of a given Viper smart contract code, including all the functions, variables, and so on, exists in one place. Remember, there's no inheritance. Uh, Viper requires that each smart contract's function and variable declarations are physically written in a particular order. Uh, Solidity does not have that requirement. So a function or variable needs to be declared before it's called or assigned a value. Uh, Viper's ordering requirements are not a new thing. In fact, these are present in Python. And so the ordering required by Viper is pretty straightforward and logical. Here's an example of our function and variable ordering. So we've got um, a variable called the bool, where we're declaring the variable. Then we have a function called top function and a function called lower function. And in this particular case, lower function is going to call top function. And so lower function, I mean, top function has to be in the file before we ever get to call it. Whereas in Solidity, you don't actually have to put them in order. In Solidity, you could call top function before defining it. In Viper, you have to define something before you call it. Similarly, when we called this the bool, that was defined before we called it in the top function. So that's just something to keep in mind that from an ordering perspective, you have to declare stuff before you call it in Viper, which is not the case in Solidity, which lets you actually define stuff before you call it, or which lets you call stuff before you define it. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit more about uh, you know, some other topics. Um, Viper does support ERC-20, so you can create your own tokens, which is really important. Uh, and basically, it implements ERC-20 as a pre-compiled smart contract, allowing these contracts to be easily used out of the box. Contracts in Viper have to be declared as global variables. So for example, if you're declaring uh, ERC-20, you might say token, address ERC-20 in Viper. So let's talk about compilation. Viper has its own online code editor and compiler, which allows you to write and then compile your smart contracts into bytecode, ABI, and LLLs using only your web browser. The Viper online compiler has it, so you won't be necessarily necessarily be using Remix in this case. The Viper online compiler has a variety of pre-written smart contracts for your convenience, including contracts for simple open auctions, safe remote purchases, ERC-20 tokens, and more. 
Uh, the tool offers only one version of the compilation software. Uh, it's updated regularly. Etherscan has an online Viper compiler, which allows you to select the compiler version. And Remix does have a Viper plugin available in the settings tab if you, if you really prefer to use Remix. Uh, you can also compile a contract using the command line. Each Viper contract is saved in a single file with the VY extension. Uh, once installed, you can then compile a contract with Viper uh, by running the command Viper like hello world.vy at the command line. Um, and if you want to generate your human readable ABI description in JSON format, you would use some extensions uh, to indicate, hey, give me some output in uh, JSON. Um, you can also, so here's an example of doing that, you know, viper fjson hello world.v.py is going to produce your ABI file so that you can um, see what it says uh, in human readable JSON format. Um, let's talk about overflow errors. Uh, one of the many problematic errors that you can run into in creating smart contracts is overflow errors at the compiler level. Uh, overflow errors in software can be catastrophic when dealing with money. For example, one Ethereum transaction from mid-April 2018 showed the malicious transfer of a massive amount of tokens. You know, 57,000 times 10 to the 54 or, you know, BEC tokens were in a single transfer. Uh, the transaction was a result of an integer overflow issue in the BEC ERC-20's token contract, uh, BEC token .solidity. Uh, Solidity developers do have access to libraries like Safe Math, as well as Ethereum uh, smart contract security analysis tools like uh, Mithril. However, developers are not forced to use the safety tools and so if safety is not enforced by the language, developers can write unsafe code that will successfully compile and later on be executed uh, by a malicious hacker. So Viper has built-in overflow capabilities uh, to prevent this pro uh, First, Viper provides a safe math equivalent that includes the necessary exception cases for integer arithmetic to prevent overflows. Second, Viper uses clamps whenever a literal constant is loaded and a value is passed to a function or a variable is assigned. Clamps are implemented via custom functions in the lower level Lisp-like language, triple L compiler, and cannot be disabled. And this additionally is another way to prevent uh, integer overflows. Uh, the Viper compiler outputs the triple L rather than EVM bytecode, and that simplifies the development of Viper itself. Uh, let's talk about reading and writing data. While it's costly from a gas perspective to store, read, and modify data, um, these sorts of storage operations are a necessary component of most smart contracts that execute in the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, smart contracts can write data in two places. Uh, they can write it to the global state and to the logs. From a global state perspective, the state variables in a given smart contract are stored in Ethereum's uh, global state. A smart contract can only store, read, and modify data in relation to that particular contract's address. You know, smart contracts can't read or write data to other smart contracts. From a logs perspective, a smart contract can also write to Ethereum's uh, chain data through log events. While Viper initially employed the log syntax for declaring this events, an update was made to bring its event declaration more in line with Solidity's uh, original syntax. Uh, while smart contracts can write to Ethereum's chain data through log events, those smart contracts are unable to read those on-chain log events that they've created. However, one of the advantages of writing to Ethereum's chain data via log events is that the logs can be discovered and read on the public chain by client apps. So for example, the logs bloom value in a mined block can indicate whether or not a log event is present. Once the existence of log events has been established, the log data can be obtained uh, from a given transaction. So in conclusion, Viper is a powerful and interesting new uh, contract-oriented programming language that's still somewhat experimental, but has a number of advantages for the Ethereum virtual machine. You know, it strives to provide superior audibility by making it easier for developers to produce readable code that can be read by others. 
Vulnerabilities are, you know, obviously unintentionally introduced into smart contracts because of code, because of the many complexities of programming languages like Solidity. And Viper is designed to make it easier to write secure code at the expense of some flexibility. You know, um, and hopefully this will allow programmers to write better smart contracts and avoid some of the pitfalls that have caused serious vulnerabilities in previous Ethereum projects. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending this uh, short little video on Viper security. Uh, tune in next time when we'll dive deeper into Ethereum.